so the book does start with the physical stuff we carry through through uh, through a war, the, not just the military stuff, but the the rabbit's feet and the pictures of your girlfriend back home and all you don't have. And then the book tries to move into the the emotional and the spiritual burdens that you're going to carry, not just to the war, but to your grave. So I had a girlfriend when I went over there, and uh, in September. Eight months after I was there, I got a Dear John letter from her, and I kept hoping that I'd be able to fix this up once I got back. And uh, I did not know what kind. And that that woman, that girl, had become the focus of my life while I was in Vietnam. She had she had ceased to be a real person. She'd become this icon. Um, and then, of course, she had sort of you know <laughs> said, "Take a hike." And but you can't just let go of of a vision like that of the thing that has kept you going. We got into a fight. It was up in the DMZ, and there was a young man that was he was dead. And I I went through his pockets, and he had a picture of his wife and his children. That hit home. That track was hit by three rocket-propelled grenades. I heard the guys screaming. Some of them lost legs and arms and stuff like that. Somebody crying for help, you just gotta go. And and that's what I told Cap when he'd put me in for Bronze Star. I said, I'm no hero. I said, I just did what comes natural. In my own experience, the Vietnamese people hated me and I gave them every reason to hate me. I beat them. I sometimes killed them. I destroyed their houses. I destroyed their crops. I destroyed their fields. I destroyed their culture. Why in the hell should those people like me? You know, the funny thing about Vietnam is that I, I was getting Time magazine every week, and I could look around and see that. Uh, uh I don't know what war they're talking about, but that's not what's going on here. We actually had an incident happen where one of our line companies uh, stumbled upon a, a fairly large uh, cache of uh, Viet Cong weapons and ammunition. This, this little action actually made it into the papers, and we read that we had set the Viet Cong effort back by at least four months in our area. Within a week, the bridge, 150 meters in front of our battalion compound, was dropped by Viet Cong sappers. An Amtrak hit a 50-pound box mine. Several men were killed. A bunch more were wounded. A patrol out at Phuc Trac Bridge was ambushed. Several people were killed. Several people were wounded. I mean, nobody told the Viet Cong that they'd been set back for four months. It was a bad running joke, but if you survived the first 10 or 15 seconds of an ambush, you were going to live. The entire time we were there, we described it as hours and hours and hours of boredom, interrupted occasionally by just shocking moments of terror. And there is just nothing that you can describe about all of a sudden hearing gunfire uh, coming from a place you can't see and hearing bullets and knowing that they were meant for you. No matter how you describe it, you, you clutch up and uh, you get down and you, you know, we we would burrow and we would do everything we could to find cover and fight back but honestly uh, it's scary I mean I, I don't have a, a good formula for how you do that because so much of it was just luck of the draw you were either in the range of fire or you weren't it plays the same for everybody and for uh, how it works on your emotions I mean, it's it's frightening stuff looked up and there are two F-100 Super Sabre jets like this. They're coming directly at us. The lead plane has already punched the pickle switch and will turn loose canisters of napalm. Hal was trying to stop the second guy from dumping his arms. 
but unfortunately for two or three engineer demolition guys, they were right in the path. And in that flame, I could see these two men dancing and screaming. And someone yelled, get this man's feet. And I reached down and picked him up, and uh, his boots crumbled. The flesh on his ankles just peeled off. I could feel the ankle bone in the palm of my hands. Uh, and we carried him over to where the wounded were. It was a young specialist uh, named Jim Nakayama out of uh, Rigby, Idaho. Married. Wife had a baby that week. He died two days later. That boy is my nightmare.